All right, so here is theology as I understand it. Um, we are in this cyclical pattern that is um, kind of envision a, a spiral or like a tornado type of shape, shape where we are each revolution draws us closer to a final point. Okay? But each revolution is basically repeating the revolution prior to it. They just kind of get crammed closer and closer together until there will be some point when history sums up, completes, or, or finishes as we know it. Um, and each degree of that circle represents some aspect of uh, that it, that we're, we're living through. Now, the, the problem is, is that as humans, what we do is we look at the world and the culture around us, and, and when we're standing at a spot looking at a particular problem, we, we, we survey the landscape that we see with our eyes, and we say, oh, this is the proper way to respond, which inevitably leads us into the next slice of pie, which is exactly what they did in the last revolution and the revolution before that. And so we just keep repeating the same issues and the same problems because we keep trying to do the same solutions over and over again. Uh, we might call them something different, but it's uh, for the most part something very old or very um, tried and tr untrue for that sake. In 1948, Winston Churchill said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Now, incidentally, that's not original. He repeated that from somebody else. He's repeating a philosopher named George Santayana from 1905 who worded it this way, those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. So I think that we fall into this pattern or this, uh, this thing where we continually fall into these cycles because, again, we're looking at the world around us. We're looking at culture. We're looking at uh, how power and wealth are played out. Uh, and we continue to believe the lie that the culture, the power, the wealth, these are the things that are going to be the deciding factors in our lives. Conversely, what God is saying is, yeah, that's not how I, how I operate. And Jesus was very plain about this when Jesus, uh, in John chapter 18, verse 36, he said, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Basically, he's saying, I, I, I got a different way of doing things than the way that you are seeing things being played out in the world. But we continue to get caught up into the world processes. So this presents us with some questions, which hopefully I'll circle back around to tonight or today. So we are actually in the process now of uh, actually finishing up Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, it literally means Rosh, means the head of. Uh, Hashanah is the year, so it's the head of the year. Um, this is... Actually, not the biblical phrase. The, uh, the biblical phrase is the, the Feast of Trumpets, which if we're going to get it real technical, it's not really the Feast of Trumpets. It's the Feast of Blowing, which is refer refer referencing the blowing of trumpets. So, <clears throat> But it's been given the name Rosh Hashanah. Um, this is the fifth of seven times throughout the year that God says, listen, I'd like you to kind of stop everything that you're doing. And I'd like you to pay attention to what God is doing. Stop running around and stop being frantic. Stop, stop being consumed by the world and, and focus for a moment on the plan that God has laid out. And he's, he's laid it out very meticulously through seven periods of time throughout the year. Um, and also, as I mentioned, Rosh Hashanah, inevitably, somebody says, why are you so Jewish? <coughs> And I'm not Jewish, first of all. <clears throat> I do say that I am Jew-ish, but I'm not Jewish. <clears throat> but 
As we read through Scripture, uh, much of the Scriptures is represented by God's people who, for a, a period of time, were the Jewish people. Okay? It was never intended to stay just the Jewish people. They, their their, their uh, task was to expand out, tell people about God, which has happened. And so God's people now, it goes far beyond just the, the ethnicity of Jewish people, uh, but to people who now believe in God through Jesus Christ. So we, there are, therefore, are part of God's people. Let me pause there for a second. Any questions so far about that? David? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Festival of Trumpets or Feast of Trumpets or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Leviticus 23 is going to have all seven of those times of the year laid out. Leviticus chapter 23. And then they're going to be touched on throughout all of Scripture, but 23 is a nice, concise chapter with all of them. Yes, sir. Any other questions? I have discovered uh, that I love dialogue far more than I love monologue. And I recognize that that makes it a little difficult with this many people. But I'm still going to attempt to break that barrier. And so, uh, if there are questions, I've invited this in the past, and I know some of you hate this. <laughs> uh, but I want to make sure that what I'm saying is clear. Okay? So, God before time uh, began recognized that there was going to be this cyclical pattern, and uh, that man would get stuck in the cyclical pattern. And so he gave us the, a repetitive pattern, something that we can look at every year to look at as we're going through our cycles to say, okay, what is it that God's doing through history? How is God standing outside of this and what is he trying to tell us? And these seven times they're called Moedim. And Moedim is simply um, a word that means appointed times, but it's got this nuance. It's like it's like a really special or an intimate time where you're connecting with somebody, you're building a relationship with somebody. And so God has these times where he wants this these special times with us where he can build relationship with us. It's oftentimes used in reference to like weddings. And so uh, there's seven of them, as we've said. Uh, real quickly, the first one is Passover. It's in the spring. The first three are in spring. Sometimes in, in Hebrew it's called Pesach. Uh, this gives us a picture, many, many pictures, but one of which in the life of Jesus, he was crucified on the day of Passover. Okay, he is the Passover lamb who was crucified for us. The second one is called unleavened bread. This is literally the day that Jesus was buried into the, in the ground, okay, or he was put into a tomb. Now, uh, there's a prayer that goes along with this day that says, Lord, give us life out of the ground because it's when they planted seed and they wanted to, to pray for that seed to spring up to life. And so they didn't recognize when they instituted that, that as they were praying, give us life out of the ground, that they're referring to a, a, a Jesus who had been crucified on the cross. The, the third one that goes right in sync with these three is first fruits. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the first fruits from the resurrection. He rose from the grave on first fruits. So as we're seeing these way back in Leviticus, we're seeing that God is telling us, I, I, there's something about history that I'm doing through the Messiah, through my Son, that I'm doing for you for the redemption of the world. Now, 50 days later, there's one called Pentecost or called Shavuot. Shavuot means weeks. It's actually seven weeks after uh, Passover. This is the day that the Holy Spirit was given. I'm giving you a snapshot, but there is volumes of stuff about each one of these that tell us more about God. I'm going through these because these are the four that in the life of Jesus have already been completed or fulfilled. He was crucified, buried, resurrected, and we received the Holy Spirit. There's three more that come in the fall. The first one is the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, which again happened just this past week. And next week happens uh, Yom Kippur, which means Day of Atonement. And then... Shortly after that, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, or Sukkot. And uh, that is an eight-day celebration that we are going to be celebrating here. And we'll talk more about that at the end of service. But I'm going to be talking about these last three fall periods of time, these Moedim, uh, for the next 
uh, three weeks, and so we get a little bit of a better glimpse. They're designed to be tools. Okay, These seven periods are designed to be tools for us. That means that we take them and build something out of them. We shape something with them. And what we're supposed to be shaping is us. We're supposed to be building us, shaping our hearts, changing our hearts. What we're not supposed to do is just take these seven times, set them on the mantle and go, aren't they beautiful? They are, but they have a purpose. Again, we don't want to fill our heads with knowledge and then become arrogant because we know so much. We want to allow these things to actually change us. We want to allow God to speak to us through them. We don't want to make these idols, but we want to make sure that we're using them as the tools that they were intended to be so that we can excavate the image of God that is within us. Any questions there about any of those feast days? I say feast days. They're not all feast days. Some of them are fast days. You fast. but No. I know it's going to take some getting used to, but all right. So, like I said, uh, Leviticus chapter 23 is where you can find all of these. In Leviticus chapter 23, it says, I Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall uh, have a rest, a reminder, by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Uh, in, in that day and age, when you blow a shofar, it had... Uh, several reasons why you would blow a shofar. The, the, the fact is that in, Deuteron or in Leviticus, it doesn't say specifically why to blow a shofar. It just says blow a shofar. A shofar is a trumpet. This is a shofar. Okay? And so the command is to blow these on that day. Now, we can look at that day and look throughout Scripture and look throughout culture and see the reason why they would blow a shofar is for one, community, calling community together. For two, it was a call to action. And three, it was for a coronation, to coronate a king, a new king. So I want to talk about each one of these uh, briefly. So far as community goes, it says, throughout Scripture, the blowing of trumpets has been a signal that people come together. Remember, they didn't have cell phones, they don't have loudspeakers, they didn't have radio, and so they would blow a shofar. A certain blowing of the shofar meant, okay, it's time to gather together and convene for a purpose and a reason. And so Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. In fact, if you've got your Bibles, I'm going to be in Matthew 24 and 25 today. Matthew 24, 30 to 31 says, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. That's a reference to Jesus. The sign of Jesus is going to appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. That's why this is connected to Feast of Trumpets or the Day of Trumpets. Trumpets are connected to the return of Jesus. That's why we're in this fall season now where we're waiting for the return of Jesus. The first four have been fulfilled. We're waiting for the final three. The next step in this is, is the sounding of trumpets and the return of Jesus. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So the elect, those who believe in Jesus, who are living as Jesus has called us, who believe in Messiah and the mission, then those are going to be called together. So here's the facts, that there is a return, there is a trumpet sound, there is a gathering of the community when they do this, the gathering of the elect. There needs to be a heart excavation, about, uh, excavating the image of God in this. And so while we say uh, he will be gathering the elect, and uh, I think maybe we got sitting here, and just because you're in church, you might go, good, I'm in. We should probably hit the pause button and ask, Lord, by the criteria that you put forth in Scripture, 
Am I included in the elect? Have I humbly come before God and allowed God to change me into the person He wants me to be? Or have I taken the knowledge that I've garnered out of Scripture and gone and said, okay, I'm going to use this as as either a weapon or a tool to accomplish what I want? So it's not just a simple we breeze over thing, are we the elect? It is something that we should truly consider. Because again, we're not looking for power or wealth, prestige or peace that this world can offer. Because it says here in this passage, the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky. He's coming with power. He's coming with power. Jesus is coming with the power, the heavenly power. He doesn't need to step into earthly power. They're two different things. Along with this comes a call to action. Uh, For the Feast of Trumpets, there is a call to action. I got a phone call, a weird phone call this past week. Uh, A guy I went to school with, like in eighth grade, so I'm talking like 40 years ago, he he sends me a message and says, hey, uh, can you call me? My life's been a roller coaster, and I got a question for you. First of all, I, I haven't talked to this guy or seen this guy in 40 years, and second of all, when I did see him, I didn't talk to him. We weren't friends. It wasn't, we weren't enemies. We just weren't, we didn't hang out. I thought it was really weird. I'm telling Jalal, this has got to be like, uh, uh, like what's it called? Scam, spam or scam or whatever, you know, one of those things. And so I asked a couple of questions, and then I blocked my number, and then I called him. And it was him. I could tell immediately by his voice it was him. But he tells me, he says, listen, I just had a triple bypass. Well, his first question was, Wait, what are you? Are you a priest? I'm like, no, I'm not a priest. Uh, After I explained I was a pastor, he says, okay, I I just had a triple bypass. I want to know if I've altered my timeline. I feel like when I was born, I was given a date that I was supposed to die. Have I changed that? Have I altered that timeline? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I'm going to lean upon the idea that God is omniscient and he knows. And maybe God led you into a place where you got that triple bypass and you didn't die. But really what it boils down to is I think he's asking the wrong question. Your timeline is altered. Okay, You could have died from that. That's not the question. The question is, what are you going to do with the extra time now? What are you going to do as a result of this? And then as I'm thinking about this for him, I think, well, why do we have to wait for a triple bypass to ask that question? Why do I have to wait for added time to go, okay, what should I do now? As we're sitting here today, that should be the question that we're asking. What should we do now? What should we do with our time? Matthew chapter 25, it continues in the same conversation that Jesus is having about when he's going to come back. He has this conversation. And he's talking about this call to action. You know, biblical language is often, often saying, uh, using military language. We're called to battle. We're called to, to war. And, and unfortunately, when we, we read this, we look at it through an earthly lens, and then we think that we're supposed to be up fighting people and, and, and vying for battle, and vying for victory, and defeating each other. But see, Jesus is very clear what he calls us to. And it's not a battle against flesh and blood. It's not a battle against each other. It's a battle against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of the wickedness in the heavenly places. Right? Right? What is that? 
How do you put your finger on that and say, oh, well, okay, I'm going to battle that, but I'm not going to battle people. What's beautiful is in Matthew chapter 25, this is the only description you're really going to get in, in, in the Bible about what Judgment Day looks like. Now, we know that it is based upon Jesus and upon uh, us embracing Jesus, but, but Jesus says, here's what Judgment Day is going to look like. <clears throat> when, he son, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels are with Him, and He's going to sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He's going to put the sheep on his right. He's going to put the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to drink. I'm sorry, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you, invis and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? This is Jesus saying, listen, hunger, thirst, poverty, despair, loneliness, these are the powers, the darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness that we're called to against. These are the things that we should be battling. <clears throat> Not flesh and blood. Hunger and thirst and poverty and despair and loneliness. And we can do that. We can engage in that. We can do that in our very own homes with our family. You can go to work and you can engage in that. Your extended family, come to your church and that's what a community is about. How can we help one another? That's why we have the market. We have market today after service. That's precisely why. While we give out boxes of food, it's not food that we're giving. We're, we're, we're building the kingdom of heaven with every canned good that somebody is handed. You can do this in your community. There is, we talked about it at the beginning. There is no lack, no lack of dark forces to stand up against. This recent hurricane has created massive devastation in places like North Carolina. And darkness has descended upon people there in ways that they never anticipated. Most of us are not going to have the opportunity. You were talking about, can we go down there? I know people, I've got friends who are pastors, they're putting groups together. I'm not one to reinvent the wheel. But if you, if you want to go down, i got a, a friend who's going down for a week. Or if you want to drive down for however many days that you can, I'll connect you with him. They've got supplies going down. We've got, we've got, he's got two semis going down. We've got some things here that we're going to donate. I'm going to see if I can work in a few days to go down. Yes, there's opportunity to go down. We partner with Matthew 25. Matthew 25 is an incredible organization that does work all over the globe, and they are like on top of this. So if you can't go down, there's still a way that you can help. There's still a way that you can... When, once a month, we gather at Matthew 25 for, for things just like this. It's sorting and gathering and packing and boxing things and so that when devastations like this happen in North Carolina, they're ready to send what's needed. So if you don't have the money to help out, or you don't have the time to travel down there, maybe you've got time to, to go over to Matthew 25 and pack some boxes for them, separate some clothes for them. If you want to make a donation, make a donation to Matthew 25 so that they can funnel that money down to, to help. But if you're able to help out, I, I want to encourage you to do that. 
But also don't think that, well, I donated to this cause, my Christian duty is done. Um, I had a, I had a, 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 I had a video that I had to watch for class, and uh, it was about. Um, I shared this this morning. It was a group of men who were engaged in counseling because they were abusive to their wives, and uh, one of the men was really, really happy because he was like, I, "I'm doing so good." I'm not abusing her as much as I was. Now, I'm glad you all laughed because that's a ridiculous statement and we recognize it as a ridiculous statement. But too often times we, we, we look at our Christianity and the way that we, we serve and the way that we give and the way that we live out our Christianity that way. Well, I did a little bit. And so I didn't do it all, but I did a little bit and that's enough. Um, we, we lean back on that you know, idea that, oh, I'm a sinner. I'm a, I'm a sinner, so I, I, it's okay. I, I, I beat her just a little bit, so it's okay. But if we, no, a little bit isn't enough. A little bit isn't enough when we're serving this God that we serve. And I'm not, when I say a little bit isn't enough, I'm not talking about dollars. Okay might be dollars, but I'm talking about your heart. A little bit of your heart isn't enough. How is it that we, how is it that we dedicate our lives to what it is that God's calling us to? We'll try to pull up the video at the end of the service if we have time and, and uh, show it to you there. <clears throat> I want to get to the last point. The last point is about coronation of the king. When you blow the, blow the trumpets, is to recognize that there's a new king. And in fact, in this passage in Matthew chapter 25, it, it says that. It says in Matthew 25, the king will answer and say to them, after they said, how did, how did we feed you? How did we give you something to drink? And it acknowledges that the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, then you did it to me. It's an acknowledgement that, that Jesus is the king. See, a coronation maybe implies that we're giving Jesus a title, but that's, the, that's not the reality. The reality is that Jesus is king, period. <laughs> Whether you want him to be or not. The question is, do you recognize that? Are you accepting Jesus as king? Because the elect who will be gathered, the elect, they, they have embraced Jesus as king. They have responded to the call of the king. They have recognized what the king has called them to and the kingdom that he's called them to and what kind of kingdom that is. And that it's a different kingdom than, than the, what we see around us. But it's a kingdom that's fueled by, by grace and mercy and justice and love and kindness and generosity and charity. So when we embrace Jesus, we embrace the fact that he's king. We embrace his kingdom. The coronation is explained in dramatic detail in all the Gospels, particularly in Mark, because Mark uses a very specific way to tell the story. It's how the, the Caesars were coronated as Caesar, as, as emperor, and he follows the same pattern, but it's completely inverted. Because when Jesus is given the crown, it's a crown of thorns. When Jesus is given the robe, he is ridiculed and mocked. When Jesus has walked up on top of a hill where, where Caesar would sit on his throne, Jesus is nailed to a cross. <clears throat> it's completely inverted because he says the true power the true power comes not the way that we 
fight and squabble over it in this world? The true power comes through following in the footsteps of Jesus. He sat at a table with his friends, his disciples. He sat at a table with the guy who was going to betray him. And he broke the bread. And he explained that this is my body. My body is going to be broken also for you, for all of us. And then he took a cup. He's like, this cup is like the cup of my blood. And my blood's going to be poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Notice the inversion. Jesus is pouring out his own blood for the sins. Grasp what sin is. A sin is an offense against God. Jesus is God. Jesus is saying, I will pour out my own blood for your offense against me. As opposed to saying, I want your blood. I want your blood for your offense. He's pouring out his own blood for his enemies. <laughs> 